I am so excited to be welcoming you all to the NOAA Science Seminar, Diving Deep to Explore the Gulf of Mexico Blue Holes, which will be an exploration of blue holes, underwater springs, and sinkholes in the Gulf of Mexico. This seminar series is co-hosted by NOAA Ocean Exploration and the NOAA Central Library. And my name is Logan Klein. I am a Canal Marine Policy Fellow working at NOAA Ocean Exploration in the Science and Technology and Outreach and Education Divisions. I'm really excited to introduce you to our seminar speakers, Dr. Emily Hall and Mr. James Coulter from Moat Marine Laboratory in Sarasota, Florida. Dr. Hall is a senior scientist and program manager who manages the chemical and physical ecology and ocean acidification programs at Moat Marine Laboratory. Dr. Hall's research focuses on the effects of local and global stressors on coastal and marine organisms, as well as unique habitats such as seagrass beds or offshore deep holes that might, might be able to withstand or alleviate the effects of these stressors. Mr. Coulter is a senior scientist and program manager and manages the benthic ecology program at Moat Marine Laboratory. Mr. Coulter's research focuses on submarine karst features, groundwater seeps, the interaction between groundwater and oceanic water and invertebrate populations, invertebrate ecology and in population structure, environmental assessments, and habitat restoration. So that's a lot. Dr. Hall and Mr. Coulter's project was supported via the NOAA Ocean Exploration Fiscal Year 2019 funding opportunity. So thank you both very much for your time and for choosing to share your really exciting work with us. And I'm gonna hand the floor over to you now. Very well, thank you for the introduction. Um, and I would like to say good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us to listen to the tales of the mysterious Gulf of Mexico Blue Holes. I would like to actually start by dedicating this talk to the memory of Dr. Natalie Vallette Silver, who was a scientist with, with NOAA and a dear friend who gave us much encouragement and valuable advice over the years that we've, that we've been pursuing, pursuing the exploration of the Gulf of Mexico Blue Holes. I will be describing the early days of, of our Blue Hole scientific exploration and research, and Dr. Hall will be presenting some of the amazing discoveries that we have made over the course of a number of years and keep in mind what we will present today is only a small portion of the information that we have found out about these blue holes. But I'd also like to point out the invaluable role of non-science diver explorers. Indeed, none of this would have been possible without those fishermen and divers who were the explorers that discovered and mapped many of these features. And they also pioneered deep diving techniques. So first, I would just like to put out the question, what the heck is a blue hole? Uh, well, most simply, is an underwater sinkhole, uh, and for our purposes, sometimes perhaps a spring. And technically, it is referred to as a submarine karst feature. So what does that mean? Well, karst is a porous form of rock, and in Florida, it's limestone, which allows for the movement of water, which causes the dissolution of rock from, to form cracks and crevices in the subsequent development of underground streams and caves. I'll briefly describe the formation process in more detail momentarily. Um, but first, I need to digress for a moment. Not getting, how do I get a slide? There we go. Um, we are, okay, conducting research on the Gulf of Mexico blue holes requires what's known as scientific diving. Is a scientific research institution, MOAT's diving activity is governed by the American Academy of Underwater Sciences, known as AAUS. They set the standards for scientific diving in the workplace for safety purposes. Um, I have outlined here just kind of the basic ranges. I've consolidated a few for brevity. You have snorkeling, shallow diving, which is down to about 333 feet, intermediate, which is down to about 66 feet, deep nitrox which goes down to 132 feet and the technical range, which is um, down to depths of 100 meters or around 330 feet. In some rare cases, divers actually go slightly deeper. But under the guidelines, um, the various levels are mandated for experience and also training purposes to ensure safety at all levels of diving. Because each, each represented depth increase represents increased risk based on physiological effects of increasing water pressure on the human body. So uh, my direct involvement um, with, 
Lugo research began in the early 1990s, around 1991 or 92, where I um, made some inquiries, not quite as far back as these two guys you see on the left frame there with the dive equipment, but far enough back where at, at the time where I started, my hair was actually brown. Um, in the water experience, I actually started from around 1996. But I was in a local Sarasota dive shop one after I met a gentleman by the name of Kurt Bowen, um, an average height guy at the time, kind of a weightlifter type physique. And he came up to me and said, you work at Moat? And I said, yeah. And he said, I want to use your boat. And I'm like, well, that wasn't up to me. But, and uh, then he explained to me, he was putting together a team to explore offshore springs. He told me they were 30 to 50 miles offshore and that they were putting together a team of divers to explore them, which and they could be quite deep in cases that were they didn't know how deep. There's no way there, nobody had ever dove on these to be go inside them and find out how deep they are. But back then, Moat didn't really have a boat capable of hauling a team of divers 50 miles offshore, at least not if you wanted to come back. So, and, and that also at the time, I was the only Moat diver who had any kind of diving experience at depths over 100 feet. So that was the limit of my experience uh, with CART at the time. And they found some other transportation began mapping some of these features. Um, this was also a group of Florida divers who pioneered early non-military use of uh, what's known as trimix, where you add helium to your breathing mixture to reduce the effects of nitrogen narcosis. So they were the uh, explorers in Florida that bought, brought the existence of blue holes into public knowledge. What I was interested in is could these blue holes, could they be important? Because if they were actually springs, as many people called them, as an invertebrate ecologist, I knew that fresh water offshore would be a big deal because biologically freshwater seawater divide uh, is very important. The salinity is a major biological community structuring factor that affects the physiology of aquatic organisms. So an offshore water, freshwater community would be very unique and uh, it would bring up a lot of questions could potentially harbor very, very unique specimens that far offshore. But well, make a little long story short, um, we have never found any freshwater large flows of springs offshore. But we have observed groundwater exchange and there are in fact a couple of uh, seeps which we can call springs, but they are saltwater. Um, this next image shows the Florida coastline. Um, approximately 12,000 years ago, eight to 12,000 years ago. Now sinkholes form only on exposed land and because when water move, can have movement, and I'll get to that in a second. So the site that we um, know is uh, what we're gonna, that we studied here was right around in this region, 30 to 50 miles off the coast of Florida. So that formed about that time of year. Now, interestingly, that's about when the first artifacts from human habitation in Florida go back eight to 12,000 years ago. So that uh, the archeology span of course is not something we were in involved with. Okay. Now what we're gonna see here is a brief animation of sea level rise. So the last part was quick, but what you saw the first image was um, the Florida shelf about 12,000 years before present, and then sea level rise over the next 12,000 years to, to our current configuration. Now in geologic time, yeah, it was an instant. It was like the flash, like you just saw there, um, because that would be a relatively quick event in terms of the new geology and sea level rise. Okay. It's not letting me advance. Okay, just having a little problem advancing. I will be with you in a moment. There we go. Shut up. Okay. So when I went into, I so I was fascinated with the possibilities. But um, so years later, I had made a number of dives already on these sites. But to give an example, um, I started doing literature searches in in quite serious and um, a little bit later on. And I could find no reference even early on to submarine sinks or springs. Basically in Florida it was a new topic to science. Um, 
our primary information sources were divers, sport and commercial fishermen, and ex explorers who were the first ones to document these sites. Um, the Florida continental shelf blue holes, they're, most of them are far offshore, 25 to 50 miles. They're deep to the rim of these is 75 feet and greater. And the bottom of blue holes can be very deep and um, many of them are over 200 to 300 feet. And they were not on anybody's um, scientific agenda radar, if you will, uh, because they were not described in the literature. There was only one small reference in this, in this book in the Gulf of Mexico, Origin Waters and Biota, to the fact that offshore springs existed, but they had no locations or other really any pertinent information on, on, the, on the function or role of these the habitats. So um, there was no funding available back when I was getting involved in this because basically what I got from a lot of places was that if it's so important, why hasn't anybody studied them? It was kind of a catch-22, which illustrates what we have found the importance of philanthropy in science, which funded a lot of this early exploration. But then in 2005, I became aware of NOAA's OE program. And that was when I got the first grant to do some uh, inquiries of blue holes in the Gulf of Mexico. So briefly how they form, um, making of a sinkhole, for instance, you get rainwater that falls on, on the surface, on the ground. It sinks down through the soils and into the water, into the rock. Water goes into the rock and moves through the rock and gradually the caves are formed and channels by the dissolution of the rock, as I mentioned earlier. Now, we, what happens when sinkhole forms is the ceiling collapses. Um, you get under, you got underground void, the ceiling collapses and you form a sinkhole. It's a really process is actually quite simple. They get a spring when you have the recharge areas for water are at a higher level than the ultimate source of the spring, which is at a lower level. So you have a hydraulic pressure that pushes water up basically under, on, underground downstream from the, from the recharge area. So what we have here, we're gonna have a brief animation of how a sinkhole forms. Here it shows an underwater void, uh, underground void, maybe with connection to a, a terrestrial lake. But at some point, if the water levels drop, the ceiling might collapse, and you have what's commonly referred to as sinkholes. These can also not always form caves as well. They might just form depressions uh, in the ground itself. Now, the terrestrial comparisons in Florida, there's a, quite a number of them. Further north, you get lots and lots of sinkholes. Um, and they're, the state actually maintains not, um, not on a strict adherence to a policy, but they maintain a database of, um, of sinkholes that was used to be formally uh, archived by the Florida Geological Survey. But the database can still be found online, but it's voluntary. So they don't really have a map every sinkhole in Florida. Um, this shows warm mineral springs in Ariel which is a popular tourist destination in Sarasota County. It also has warm water, which means the source of the spring is from a, a, a very deep saltwater source. It is um, mineralized water or salty. Um, so it's a tourist attraction because people believe it to have healing properties. Now, um, this image here on the, on the left here shows uh, Colonel Bill Royal, who was the first basically one of the first people ever dive in these springs. And on the right-hand side, you see what it looks like from the inside. And he found human remains at a depth of about 60 feet on a ledge in warm mineral springs. Uh, and this was back in the uh, mid to late 1950s. Well, people didn't believe him because uh, it was against current archeological beliefs at that time that there were no people, native peoples in Florida that long ago. And here we have, you know, the tourist aspect of it. A lot of Eastern Europeans come here because um, they believe in the, you know, traditional healing waters and sulfur waters, that type of thing. So it's very common, but underneath and there's part of this area is roped off, but out in the middle of this area is where the actual hole is, where we saw on the previous slide, that goes down about 220 feet. Now, not too far from warm mineral springs is Little Salt Springs. This actually made the cover of Science in 1979 because they also found the University of Miami archaeologists 
found human remains um, submerged in and around the sinkhole. You know, lower sea level, the lake level wasn't as high, but it was a swampy area. And they, uh, the people at that time, for whatever reason, they would bury their dead around the swampy areas around the, around the water in the sinkhole. Uh, and they have found artifacts that date back, uh, human artifacts, not, not bones, but artifacts that date back as far as 12,000 years before present. So how many of these sites are offshore? Well, there's probably a lot, but um, resulting from our 2005 study, which was funded by NOAA, uh, we found about uh, all, pretty much all these yellow sites and some additional sites that we mapped out. We were able to visit a number of those, these sites in particular, which we gathered more information about and uh, began to try to formulate plans for doing more in-depth research. But these were some of the sites that we visited and verified because a lot of sites were known by different names. Um, some of them we would go out and look and you couldn't find them because some of them are actually quite small. They're not, not large, uh, which includes submarine caves. But the um, objectives of our first uh, 2005 OER project were to explore and characterize the submarine holes. So we were doing that when we would find them. And we compare sites and look for new holes. So we also did that. We were, one of our primary interests was finding sites with flow, because this has all kinds of implications for um, things like algal blooms or harmful algal blooms, you know, that might be carrying nutrients, or, or even if it's a reverse flow, it can uh, be concerned with saltwater intrusion into the Florida and aquifer. So all those are concerns. And whether that be offshore freshwater springs, which I already gave that away, we never have yet found an offshore freshwater spring. Still hopeful, but um, that may never happen because of reduced hydrologic pressure on, on terrestrial Florida. So I'm gonna stop this for a second. These are some of the, the around the periphery here are some of the sites, they're just renderings, drawings of what they look like. Some of them are actually cave features like in the upper left and this one over here called Megadome. And what you're going to see here is a video um, of Megadome, the entrance, which is quite small and uh, really need cave diving experience to go in this one. It has a little bit of rock around the edge, but um, this, this first video shows the entrance to Megadome here, right in the middle. So there's some rock around the outside, but then it's basically a sand pit. And there's this hole in the bottom. You can compare that to the size of a diver. And the divers would go down, I've been down, you go in this hole, you go over to the left side there, and you duck down into a tunnel. And the tunnel is about a little bit less than a meter wide. It takes a right-hand turn and goes down. Um, it takes a right-hand turn and goes, goes down um, through a hole that's about 12 meters or so. In length and you open up into uh, a large cave that uh, overall depth is greater than 116 meters and the size of what we can dub megadome at 91 meters deep is about two is about uh, 61 meters across in diameter so in the overall height from top to bottom is greater than 230 feet so it's quite large cave in the Gulf of Mexico now this is a pic Oh, let me go back. This is a uh, video of a diver going into the hole I just described to you. It gets turbid because uh, there were some divers that went down before him and the tunnel that's less than a meter wide. There's a line in there, of course, which we use to find our way out again. And he'll drop out in just a few moments here into the cave, which appears as a large dark abyss. There's lights you see there from other divers. He gave the okay signal and all this black off to the right is the cave. So he's now in the cave and begins looking around. And this is this is quite dramatic and we haven't, uh, we want to do more exploration of this cave actually, because there's actually animals living in this cave and a Goliath grouper goes down this hole and you can sometimes be seen at the ceiling of the cave. So what I would like to do now um, is, 
introduce or let Dr. Hall take it from here and discuss some of the findings that we have learned at primarily at the, well, a number of holes that we've uh, investigated in, in greater depth. So just all right, thanks, Jim, um, for that great introduction into the history of blue hole research here. Uh, you, you have definitely been an inspiration to me on my journey on this research. And so I've been at Moat since 2005, where I started as a postdoc. Um, as mentioned earlier, I wear many hats here now running two different programs, but mostly related to coastal and marine chemistry. Uh, my, uh, especially water quality and carbonate chemistry. Uh, and I guess I understand how tedious chemistry lectures can be. I'm not going to get too detailed into the nitty, nitty gritty of the chemistry, but um, really it's important to understand how the chemistry of these holes uh, is impacting the biological structure of these holes. Um, and so uh, Jim introduced me to these holes when I started working here, but it wasn't until around 2011, 2012 that we really started to talk about the chemistry of these holes and how unique they are. Uh, I was especially excited to learn about the change in pH in these holes. And, and that's because one of, my, what, one of my programs, the Ocean Acidification Program, focuses on how changes in seawater pH can affect ecosystems and biota. And these changes in pH are typically caused by coastal or ocean acidification, which is a result of elevated carbon dioxide, um, either from the atmosphere, so for example, from the burning of fossil fuels, or from biological breakdown of organic matter, freshwater input or improper waste disposal and, and other processes. And so the pH in the holes that Jim and his dive buddies have been visiting often dropped from ambient seawater, so Gulf of Mexico, numbers of about 8.1 to 8.0 down to as low as even 6.0. Under ocean acidification scenarios, also known as the evil twin of climate change, seawater pH is predicted to drop to an out, about an average of 7.8 or 7.6 in the next 50 to 100 years on average. And so with that in mind, I thought that these holes might represent a natural laboratory for us to study the effects of acidification or the lowering of pH on an ecosystem that seems to be thriving. So we decided to apply for some grants uh, for me to start looking at a more depth at the chemistry of these holes. Um, and we were awarded a Protect Our Reef license plate grant, which is only for the state of Florida, um, to study two of our more southern blue holes that were one, shallow enough for me to dive. Jim described some of the diving techniques. And at that stage, I was only open water advanced certified um, uh, and had coral growing around the rim because part of the goal of Protect Our Reefs grants are to understand coral. Uh, and three were accessible and had a wide enough opening not to be considered a cave dive like the last video that Jim just showed you. So the two holes that we uh, started with were Captiva Blue Hole, which is the top left in the figure here, and uh, which is about 34 miles offshore from Captiva, and Naples Spring to the right, which is about 27 miles offshore of Marco Island. And so these are two relatively shallow holes. Uh, the rim of Captiva Blue Hole is only about 30 meters or 98 feet, and the rim of uh, Naples Spring is only about 23 meters or 75 feet. That differ, and they differ morphologically. So you can see that the shapes of each of these holes is, is somewhat different from each other. Naples Spring is more of a traditional uh, sinkhole structure, while Captiva Blue Hole is more of a traditional spring structure. And we were funded for one year to visit each site and try to get as much information as we could, both chemically and biologically. And so this funded project was also an opportunity to develop a sampling plan. So it's not easy to dive even at these shallower depths and collect samples, take measurements, and not be tempted to go further into the holes without exceeding dive limitations. And so here you can see myself and another staff member as well as one of our interns on the shallower Naples Spring getting ready to take water samples for nutrients. Um, I have to mention that in the diving world, it's not traditional to sit on your knees and work, but sometimes when you're juggling a lot of equipment, including having to shake clean water out of the sample bottles, they have to be filled ahead of time, otherwise they'll collapse on themselves at these depths to fill with actual seawater. This photograph is an example of how to anchor scientific equipment to the rim of the hull without, hopeful, without hopefully falling into the hole. It's a way to not disturb the bottom by laying cinder blocks and zip tying recording data instruments to it, what we call the cinder block of science. This is a thermograph inside a PVC container that allows us to record temperature over long periods of time. 
We typically lay these at the rim on a line going down into the rim and at multiple depths to collect up, up to a year's worth of data. And this kind of data has allowed us to look at uh, uh, certain things like when hurricanes come across the Gulf of Mexico or other large storms passes to see if there's turnover of water or exchange with surface water in these holes. After a year at the hole, when we can manage to get back out to retrieve the thermographs, you can see how much growth there is on and around the PVC container. And so most of what you're seeing here is sponge and calcifying um, algae. So these are very much rocky reef type environments. And this image shows how we have to process the samples immediately once back on board the research vessel. It's what we, what we like to call our field laboratory. So often water chemistry samples have to be filtered and preserved right away or else the chemistry can change, even if just in a cooler on a long trip home. And so uh, this does include carrying with us many dangerous type chemicals um, such as mercuric chloride, but it does help us prevent microbial and algal communities from affecting our samples on the long boat rides back. Because a lot of times our the trips back to shore can be anywhere from two to four hours. So here's a little bit of data from the, those trips, Captiva Blue Hole and Naples Springs. So on the left, we have Captiva Blue Hole and the right is Naples Spring. The left graph in each panel is taken from early fall or what we would consider the wet season here, from earlier trips in 2007 that Jim did before I started working on this project. And the right graph in each panel is um, considered the dry season from early summer 2014, which is when I started working or when I was working with Jim on this. And so you're looking at salinity in blue, temperature in orange, dissolved oxygen in gray, and pH in yellow. And so these are important water quality parameters that can tell us a lot about the physiochemical makeup of the water. The dashed horizontal white line is the rim of each hole, while the top of each graph is the surface of the water. And you'll notice that the lines don't all go down to what we call the bottom. Um, and that's probably because, likely because we can't always reach the bottom in the time allotted for a safe dive. And so diving these holes does make it a little more difficult to collect some of the data, but it's really difficult to get um, instruments from a ship uh, above, the, above the rim of the hole and get it down into the hole, even if you have a large hole opening. So what's interesting here is that you see a drop in all four parameters, either at the rim or just below the rim, as in the case of Captiva Blue Hole. And both holes have a large opening, anywhere from 60 to 75 feet in diameter, but the chemistry changes are at different levels within each, within each hole. Temperature drops dramatically in both holes, um, both seasons from 25 to 30 degrees Celsius at the surface down to as cold as 10 to 15 degrees Celsius, closer to the bottom. Dissolved oxygen drops down to three or even zero milligrams per liter as you get, get closer to the bottom of each hole. Um, and dissolved oxygen is very important, and I'll, you'll see a little bit later in some of the other hole work, um, just as oxygen in the atmosphere is important for us to breathe. And so different marine organisms have different thresholds of what they can withstand, and even so in these holes. And so these changes in dissolved oxygen help describe different layers of biology that we see in the holes. pH also drops through, um, though only down to about 7.5 or 7.0, but remember that's a level predicted for oceans in 50 to 100 years from now. So it, it, it's giving us a little bit of insight into what we might see. And so now that we establish these natural laboratories and how to study them more efficiently, we applied for a NOAA Ocean Exploration Grant and were awarded one in 2018. Um, this grant funded us for two years, which actually ended up being four years because of the pandemic and other issues that I'll fill you in on, um, and was a collaboration with Harbor Branch and Florida Atlantic University, the Georgia Institute of Technology, and the U.S. Geological Society. We also partnered with Ringling College of Art and Design in Sarasota, Florida, and PBS, the Changing Seas series, as part of education and outreach methods for this work. Uh, and for this study, we, the call was to work with ocean technology to design and develop a way to explore and characterize these holes that are considerably deeper than previous holes that we've worked with. And so this ocean exploration grant also required that we work on the outer Florida continental shelf in deeper waters. So we selected two of the furthest west blue holes that we've already verified, and that go down to depths of 100 meters or greater. So Amberjack Hole and Green Banana Sink were the two holes. So they, I also have to note that many of these holes were named by early explorers and fishermen who found them. 
the story of Green Banana, it's pretty simple. It's that there were a bunch of green bananas floating by while a group was fishing on the spot. Um, if you want to know about some of the other names, you'll have to ask Jim and some of his dive buddies off camera. Um, you'll see here that Amberjack Hole, or what I'll call AJ from now on, is shaped similarly to Naples Spring and is more of a sinkhole structure, while Green Banana is more like Captiva Blue Hole and is more of a spring structure. The rim of AJ starts at around 35 meters or 115 feet, and the rim of Green Banana starts at about 50 meters or 165 feet. And so I did mention that we worked with ocean technology experts to explore these two very deep holes. And the ultimate plan was to use an autonomous benthic lander that could be placed at the very bottom of the hole and sit there for long periods of time while taking periodic samples and continuous measurements for which is something um, which is something that even technically rated divers couldn't do. Um, I like to compare this to a moon lander. Similar concept in that it's a tool for us to go to depths uh, that most of us can't get to or even stay at for long periods of time. Um, the picture on the left here gives you an idea of the size of the lander, and it is quite heavy. It's loaded with batteries, sampling devices, multi-parameter meters, and other instruments that are programmed to take samples throughout its time at the bottom. It was able to take water samples and pour water samples in the bottom sediment for us. And this lander was originally developed at Georgia Tech, but was modified by our partners at Harbor Branch FAU specifically for these holes. And so the first hole that we wanted to focus on was AJ because it was shallower. It was the shallower and the closer of the hole. So a little bit more logistically uh, easy compared to Green Banana. And so at each hole and each sampling event, it took us a week of out and back trips each day using our two large research vessels at Moat, as well as volunteer boats to assist us. AJ Hole is about 32 miles offshore, while Green Banana is about 55 miles offshore of New Pass in Sarasota, Florida. And this photo is the rim of AJ. So you can see how productive and full of life and, and how much of a rocky reef structure this is. So now I'm gonna take you into a journey into Amberjack Hole. So this video is from a GoPro attached to my dive buddy. That's me on the bottom down there. It's the two of us descending down to 115 feet at the rim of the hole. You can see incredible schools of fish, including Amberjack hanging around us and the rocky reef that's surrounding the rim. So that, that black hole over to the side, that black area, that's actually the hole off to the right there. And you also might notice some lionfish hanging out around the rim. Um, and they, they do tend to congregate and hang out around these rocky environments. Um, the sandy bottom to the left of the hole is just the normal bottom of the Gulf of Mexico in that region. And so typically we'll see sandy bottom until you come up to these holes when you'll start to see things like seagrass, macroalgae, soft coral, and then a rocky reef environment where it drops into the hole. And so uh, that yellow bag, that's me just placing some of our equipment, getting ready to start doing a survey around the hole. I'll be laying a measuring tape um, just to, to get started. So you'll see that here in a second. And so, whoops, let me move forward to the next one. And so the next video is what made the news, including the Tonight Show, regarding the glowing blue hole of the Gulf of Mexico. So that was actually a view from a diver within the hole looking up out of the hole. Um, and so we're continuing down the journey into the bottom of AJ Hole. And so this, at this point, it's no longer myself and my team. These are videos, these, this is a video from our volunteer technical diver who, divers who are certified to go much deeper. Uh, you might also notice all the debris floating around in the water, what we call marine snow. It's made up of plankton, organic matter, detritus, and other types of organisms. And so you'll start to see the lander show in the video now. And so this is where the deep tech divers go all the way to the bottom of the hole with the lander to ensure that it's positioned correctly so it can start taking samples as planned. Um, you'll also notice a lack of light as you get down into the bottom of these holes. Um, so it is quite dark and they do need dive lights, but I'll let you watch this for a second so you can see the diver. So it's sitting on the top of what we call a debris pile in the, in the middle of the hole. They've, they've made sure the lander is placed on it and isn't going to slide down to either side. Uh, you can see all the equipment on there, our syringes to take water samples, some of the battery packs, for example, um, and they're just checking it out to make sure it's stable and that there's no problems with it.
And so, um, let me move forward here. Uh, so since we were able to get to these holes, uh, once we were able to get there, we were able to collect water and sediment samples for a number of parameters, including water quality. So that includes nutrients, temperature, salinity, oxygen, uh, carbonate chemistry, that's for that acidification work that I was talking about, radioisotopes to determine if there's connectivity to surface water and groundwater, uh, microbial community uh, um, determination to see if there's a, to see if there are any unique groups uh, within these holes. Also, we were going to, we wanted to compare one hole to another. Um, sediment redox chemistry to describe what's happening at these holes in the bottom and biological surveys around the rim and down into the holes. We were able to visit each of these holes twice, which included during the dry season in the spring and the wet season, late summer, early fall. And this is important because we wanted to see if we could catch differences in seasons and to see if the rainy season potentially pushed water from land-based sources out into these blue holes. So the first set of data here is from Amberjack Hole um, from the spring of 2019, which is the dry season. Um, and I won't go through all this data, and I'm just going to point out some of the more interesting things. Um, the first graph shows dissolved nutrients and chlorophyll. The second shows particulate nutrients. The third is carbonate chemistry. And the fourth is temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen. But most interesting to me here is that on the first graph, there is elevated chlorophyll in the yellow line at the, surf or at the rim um, and um, just below the rim. And so this is indicative of the presence of some kind of algae. Now, unfortunately for this trip, we didn't collect samples for algae analyses to determine what kind of algae, but it does show that something is growing there and it's happy hanging out above the rim, around the rim, and below the rim. The second interesting bit of data on the first graph is the elevated nitrate, which is this blue line here, um, which we saw around 60 meters down below the rim. And so we were surprised to see this and thought that it might indicate a different source of water entering the hole from a conduit in the side somewhere. The third graph over, so skipping the second one over to the third one, which is the carbonate chemistry, you can see that pH in the red line drops incredibly, a, a good amount down to a 7.5 at the bottom of this hole. And that PCO2 increases to greater than a thousand microatmospheres. PCO2 is the blue here. And so if you follow, and for reference, if you follow well, for reference, ambient seawater typically ranges from 400 to 600 uh, microatmospheres PCO2. If you follow CO2 concentrations in our atmosphere levels in relation to climate change, we do get very nervous with numbers over 400 microatmospheres in the atmosphere. Um, and so to me, again, this is a natural laboratory to start to study or to look at what might be some possible effects of acidification. In the last graph here, Focusing on that orange line, which is dissolved oxygen, this hole reaches anoxic levels at the bottom. So no oxygen at the bottom. And this is very important when trying to understand the biology of what can survive in these environments. Um, uh, the microbial uh, communities in the bottom layer of this hole contained undocumented levels of the recently discovered phylum Wurtzio archaeota, up to 58% of the community. So it was a novel discovery and quite exciting for us. And we have a paper, Patent et al. 2021, that describes that microbial com community in this hole. Now, when we went uh, to AJ Hole in the fall during the wet season, we saw similar trends with some slight differences. So we still saw elevated nitrate at that 60 meter area. We saw elevated chlorophyll fill near the rim, but no longer at the surface. But we also saw an interesting mid-peak in pH here. Um, and dissolved oxygen as well. So even more interestingly, and another due discovery that we saw was a species of Karenia, which is a, an algae hanging around the rim and inside the hole. So for those of you, especially in the state of Florida, uh, Karenia brevis is the species that forms red tide blooms along, along the west coast of Florida almost annually. And so the species we found here is, is a different species. It's Karenia astrochroma. Um, but it's another species of toxic planktonic organism that was first discovered in 2004 in the Pacific Ocean. So moving on to green banana, where we went in the fall 2020 in the wet season. Um, unfortunately, we were delayed in visiting the hole in the spring of 2020 because of the, uh, uh, because of the pandemic. Um, so we were able to get out there in the fall, um, but this hole was much trickier to dive, even though, uh, because even the rim of the hole is at depths deeper than advanced divers are certified to go. 
So therefore myself and two other team members at Moat reached out to one of our tech volunteers and were able to get trained and certified on mixed gases and decompression dives just to collect samples at the rim of this hole. We can't thank him enough for helping us out like that, especially during a pandemic. But green bananas show differences in water quality trends. So nitrate was higher throughout the entire hole, just a blue line there again, um, and was more variable as was chlorophyll. We also didn't see as high elevated ammonia at the bottom of this hole, um, like we did in AJ hole. pH still dropped as we went down to the hole, but there was a unique peak right around an area of restriction in the hole. Dissolved oxygen also dropped, but this hole never became anoxic like what we saw in Amberjack hole. We also didn't see the same unique uh, microbial species here. We did, however, see much more Karenia here and multiple species, including Karenia brevis. So this just opened the door for us and we have many more questions now, including, um, um, you know, could these holes be a source of nutrients for Karenia that may be at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico or another starting point for some of these, um, these bloom formations. In the spring, we were delayed, unfortunately, again, getting back out to Green Banana for our dry season trip. This was still due to the ongoing pandemic, but also, unfortunately, our lander that I showed you the picture of that's quite large that gets shipped to us each for each trip from Georgia Tech, well, it was lost in the mail. Um, luckily, NOAA was willing to work with us and received a no-cost extension, allowing us to postpone the work as needed. Um, during this final trip, nutrients were more similar to what we'd seen in AJ Hull, although still with little ammonia on the bottom, pH dropped as we went down into the hole, though not as drastically, and dissolved oxygen dropped, but still not to anoxic levels. And we found no Karenia in this hole on this trip. So, so interesting, and, and it was really great that we picked up some of these seasonal differences. So with all that interesting chemistry, I'll give you a glimpse into what we saw with organisms around and in the hole. We were able to see zones of organisms, starting with the pelagic zone, um, rim, which was like a reef, that rocky reef zone, the sandy zone surrounding sand that sometimes had uh, macroalgae, seagrasses, or, or gorgonians. Um, we had uh, the surrounding uh, wall zone, the cutback zone, and a deep abiotic zone. So the dominant biodiversity around these holes really does consist of invertebrates, uh, which Jim mentioned that he loves. Uh, we can consistently see coral, sponges, anemone, pelagic fish, sea turtles, goliath grouper, sharks, and even whale sharks in these areas. I think this is one of the only locations that we personally have ever seen a whale shark. And so this is an example of how we do some of our biological surveys of the rim using measuring tape, PVC, and cameras. These two videos are from the two trips to AJ Hole. I wanted to show you these two um, because it's of the dry season in the spring on the left, um, which shows high amounts of sargassum, uh, a macroalgae that's considered a possible nuisance species in some parts of the world because it can clog waterways and drown out light to the bottom. What we have found that it roots around AJ Hole, and then once it gets too big to stay rooted, it breaks free and floats to the surface where it can still survive as a floating algae. We also see this macroalgae in Sarasota Bay at certain times of the year, um, but by the fall, this macroalgae was completely gone. And I know this is an interesting topic right now as, as we're seeing blooms of macroalgae throughout the Caribbean and up closer to the Florida Keys. So I also mentioned that we worked with PBS and changing seas earlier. Uh, so uh, we actually, they actually filmed a whole season or an episode for us. So the link to the episode is listed at the top there. Um, but you can just Google PBS Changing Seas Blue Holes and you'll find it. One of the producers, Kristen Petarakis, did also did some freelance video of our dives as well and created this short video in, uh, introduction into AJ Hole. So not only is she an amazing producer and videographer, but she also volunteered with us and assisted with our science. So you've probably noticed her name on, uh, as getting credit on a few of the photographs. So we really are excited as to how much visibility this project received and continues to receive as we hope to continue to keep that exploration going. And then one last video that I'll show you as soon as this one is complete is of an amazing sawfish that we found, that two of our volunteer tech divers found at the bottom of AJ Hole. There were two down there and they were both incredibly well preserved due to the low oxygen environment. And we were able to get one of them to the surface to send to NOAA and Fish and Wildlife to do necropsy. It did surprise us finding these endangered organisms so far offshore at these depths and um, as a pair. 
So you can see how many more questions we have um, just from the little bit of exploration that we've been able to start on these holes. I can't end this talk without mentioning two other products that have resulted from this work. So back in 2010, I initiated a project with Ringling College of Art and Design called the Art of Red Tide Science. This is where we partnered with student artists at Ringling to create outreach uh, and education tools about red tide. And so we recreated that project for this Blue Hole project and renamed it the Art of Marine Science. Jim and I met with different classes in the environmental program at Ringling and asked them to create projects using any medium they wanted to help us present this work. And these are just a few of the examples. And I don't know if you can tell where, where the, the photos of both, you know, the recreation of Jim and I are on there. <laughs> so this work has also been adapted into our education department at Moat where one of our educators, Brad Tanner, has developed a STEM-based program to help students learn about blue holes and where they actually build a model of how to collect samples at these unique locations. So we are helping spread the, the wealth of knowledge that we've gained from these holes to try to um, encourage younger and, and our future scientists to, to continue this work. And so lastly, uh, we could never have even started this work without Jim and many of his dive buddies, other divers, volunteers, colleagues, and staff. This has been a huge team effort. Funding sources include the NOAA Ocean Exploration Research Funding, the Protect Our Reefs License Plate Funding, and Philanthropy. So thank you so much for listening to our story, and we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Emily and Jim. This was excellent. Uh, just a reminder for our audience here, if you do have a question, put that in the question panel. Uh, but we do have one to kick it off, and I, am, I think, Emily, you're the one to answer this. Um, you mentioned low pH and also low uh, dissolved oxygen. Were there any instances of low pH when the dissolved oxygen was not in the hypoxic range, uh, preferably above 50% saturation? Um, yes, we did have some, it, it, but it was seasonal. It wasn't every time. Um, and we've seen that in some of the other holes, some of the other shallower holes as well. Great, thank you. And we may have to connect you with this uh, person asking because they seem very interested in that answer. Sure, happy to, happy to. Great. Okay, I'm not, oh, uh, there are more questions. They're just, they're coming in. Okay, so our next question is, um, any idea how Hurricane Ian might have affected the blue holes off of Captiva and Marco Island? Were you able to recover equipment from the blue holes since then? <laughs> Great question. Actually, Jim went out a few months ago to try to recover some equipment and it was gone. Um, uh, un unfortunately, these holes are also really big fishing spots. A lot of offshore fishermen have found these holes, which is in fact how we've been told about them. Uh, and some of our gear, we try our hardest to really secure it, but sometimes things can get caught up in fishing lines and stuff and get pulled or, or broken and dropped all the way to the bottom of the holes. Um, one of the things with the hurricanes is Jim has had thermographs in some of these holes for a lo long periods of times when hurricanes have gone over and when those thermographs aren't lost to the hurricane, he's been able to see, um, I would say, really interesting mixing after those hurricanes have gone through where the whole water column seems to have turned over and, and is mu much more uniform than having the stratification that we normally see. We're actually working on a publication right now to show some of that data from some past hurricanes. Great, thank you. Our next question is, um, is there a published list of these locations? Um, I don't know, I'll look over at Jim. No, there's not a published list. Uh, you can Google it and you'll find some. Some local fishermen have put uh, lat longs on, you know, for some of these holes. And keep in mind, some of these holes have been called different names as well. Um, but if someone is really interested in working with us, we'd be happy to share some of those numbers. Great, thank you. Um, so now we have some questions or a question uh, about the sawfish. Um, so the idea is there were two recently deceased individuals and they were near each other. And the question is, um, you know, were they of the opposite sex? Uh, were there any concerning water quality parameters that might have contributed to them being, you know, uh, at the bottom of this hole? Uh, so yeah, that, uh, good questions. <laughs> 
Um, the, you know, as I showed when you, the, the water chemistry definitely changes as you go down. So there are thoughts, and this is just theory that we've been talking about with some of our colleagues at Fish and Wildlife and NOAA about, you know, maybe they were hunting food, they were looking for food together. Uh, it's pretty far offshore, but they may have followed something down into the hole and started to hit a more, a, a lower oxygen environment and maybe just couldn't get back out. Um, that's one theory. Um, they, like I said, they were really well preserved. Were they, were they male and female? I can't remember. Yeah, the recovered one, the one that we pulled out was a male. I, I'm not sure about the second one. Uh, we are still looking into that and still working on putting together um, another paper or at least a note on that. Oh yeah, it could have been, We I, what I haven't mentioned is that we also have hydrogen sulfide in these environments um, and it could have been affected that as well. Good to know, thank you. Um, did you uh, complete any fish count surveys um, at the rim during these dives? We did not do fish count surveys. We just did um, more looking at the benthos, uh, what was on the bottom. So looking at scallops, corals, doing those kinds of counts. We are very interested in understanding the fish community there. Neither Jim or, nor I are fish biologists or ecologists. So. Uh, we are looking for someone who would like to partner with that. Uh, we There are theories that these may be nursery or, or spawning grounds for certain fish. I mean, they're definitely just loaded with fish at these sites. So That leads very nicely into my next question. What are the opportunities to get involved with your ongoing or future research efforts? Uh, the easiest thing is to email myself or Jim and we can start chatting. <laughs> Wonderful. Emily or Jim, do you have your uh, email on one of these slides that we can bring up for folks? I don't. I don't I don't think we did. But if you go to um, the Moat Marine Laboratory website, we are both listed under the research department there and you'll be able to find our information there. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A few more questions to round us out here. Do you know what species of sargassum you encountered? I do not. Jim, do no. you know? No, we do not know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there are multiple species, but I don't know what they are. No. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, how do space satellite observations assist in your programs? That's a good question. So, well, specifically talking about blue holes, when you're at, on a boat above the blue holes on the clearest day you could pass calmest clearest day you cannot see the opening of the hole from the surface it is too far down you can see it using a fish finder um, as far as satellite data uh, i know jim i think has looked to see if he can see any of these the best we might get would be some chlorophyll data uh, if it's at the surface but as you as some of the data I showed you, is sometimes we only get elevated chlorophyll right at the rim of the hole and not all the way up to the surface. So, um, it, yeah, and it depends on the resolution of the satellite. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions, so I'm going to give people a little bit of time and let you guys uh, tell us maybe one thing you didn't put in the slide deck that you would like to share before you wrap up. Oh gosh, well, <laughs> I mean, I guess one of the biggest things is we have barely scraped the surface of understanding these holes. Um, I didn't show you any of the radioisotope data. We found some unique finds with that as far as connectivity to our groundwater. You, we have a lot of questions as to are we, you know, could there be saltwater intrusion through some of these these areas? Um, you, there's a history of some of these holes may have been actually bubbling out fresh water at some point. Um, one of our uh, um, past scientists at Moat, Jeannie Clark, used to tell us that she saw actually bubbling water coming out from some of these holes, like up further up north and some of the more northern ones. And so, you know, that's something we're looking at. We really want to see if we can find freshwater influence in these holes. And, and, and there's also tidal cycles in these holes that, that again, more, more physical oceanography type stuff that we just didn't have time to talk about. Great, thank you. And, and while you were uh, answering that question, we did get two more and I think we can answer them before we run out of time. 
Um, are the holes popular for tourists or charters? Um, or are they just a, a little too far out? What? Um, yeah, we definitely have seen charter boats out there before. Um, I, you know, it is like 50 miles offshore sometimes is too far for some people, especially if you get seasick. <laughs> but um, one thing that's really nice is typically when we go out there with our marine research, you know, written on the side of our boats and they know we're going to be diving in it, uh, they, they scoot away for us to, to help us try to help these environments. The, oh, I didn't mention also a lot of these environment or this area was listed as a hope spot by Dr. Sylvia Earle. Um, partly because of the unique ecosystems and uh, trying to understand why why there are so many uh, cool like biological oases out there in the Gulf of Mexico. Oh, awesome! Good to know. Um, and lastly, um, is there a way to view the art projects created by the Ringling students? Is it on the Moat website, or can where can people find those art projects? Uh, we did, during the projects, we actually displayed them at Moat Aquarium for a little while. They're no longer up uh, as part of the displays. Um, we are, Moat Aquarium is in the process of building a new aquarium and starting to transition stuff, but I have all of those products and I'm happy to share them and show them uh, with whoever is interested. Great, awesome. You heard it here, folks. T email Emily <laughs> and she <laughs> will get that information to you. Okay. <laughs> I'm not seeing any more questions and we are about uh, finished at our time here. So I'm going to turn it over to Logan Klein to uh, close us out. Thank you so much. Um, thank you both for sharing your research and thank you, Katie, for facilitating. This is really interesting. I didn't know much about these holes beforehand, so I'm excited to have learned about it with you all. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that NOAA Ocean Exploration is going to have another seminar that's co-hosted with the Central Library that's going to take place on Tuesday, April 18th at 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And that's going to feature Dr. Daniel Wagner, who is the Chief Scientist at Ocean Exploration Trust. And he's going to be discussing an overview of the EV Nautilus 2023 field season, which I already know is going to be really exciting. So make sure to mark your calendars and thank you all again for this.